Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. On the afternoon of February 9th, 2004, Maura Murray hastily packed her backpack in her dorm at the University of Massachusetts and made a couple of pit stops before heading north in her rundown Saturn. At 7.27 p.m., a resident of Haverhill, New Hampshire, called the local police to report a car accident. A few minutes later, a school bus driver stopped to talk to the young woman who was inside or beside the car and offered her help. The woman refused, stating that she had already called AAA. The bus driver knew this couldn't be true because of the lack of cell service in the area. So he also called the police when he arrived home. By the time the first officer arrived on the scene at 7.46 p.m., Mora's black Saturn sat abandoned, and Mora was never seen again. It has been almost 20 years since Mora disappeared on that cold night in Haverhill. In that time, multiple documentaries, books, and podcasts have been made that discuss the theories and speculations surrounding her disappearance. While it's human nature to question different aspects of cases like this one and play armchair detective, Moore's family has faced unnecessary finger-pointing, personal attacks, and disgusting accusations about their involvement in Moore's disappearance. We had the chance to talk with Julie Murray, Moore's older sister, about her childhood with Mora, the circumstances around her disappearance, and the misinformation and mishandling of her case. Julie's continued advocacy for Mora also led her to found her Engage with Empathy campaign and the New Hampshire Unsolved Murdered and Missing Coalition with other victims, families, and survivors. Thank you, Julie, for talking with us and trusting us to tell Mora's story in an honest way. I'm Gina. And I'm Amber. And this is the true story of the life and disappearance of Mora Murray. Maura Murray was born on May 4, 1982, to Fred and Lori Murray. She was the youngest daughter and had three older siblings, Fred Jr., Kathleen, and Julie. The kids were surprised with another sibling several years later when Curtis was born. The family lived in Hanson, Massachusetts, a small town between the much larger cities of Boston and Plymouth. During our interview, Julie joked that they measure town size by the number of Dunkin' Donuts there are. She said when they were younger, the town only had one Dunkin' Donuts, but now there are two, so obviously it's hit the big time. In the South, you'd equate that to whether or not the town had a Dairy Queen. The Southern listeners definitely know what I'm talking about. Being in a small town and a working-class family, the kids spent a lot of time outdoors creating their own entertainment. They frequently traveled to the White Mountains in New Hampshire, where they would hike, run, and enjoy nature. The kids spent the majority of their time trying out different sports and focusing on schoolwork, two subjects in which Mora thrived. Julie told us that there was a lot of healthy competition between her and Mora, and that she missed the frequent smack talk and the sisterly love that Mora provided. Here's Julie talking about their family dynamics and a pretty funny story about an argument she and Mora got into as kids. It was great to be an older sister to her because she was so smart and she was able to help me as her older sister in schoolwork, which is amazing. Um, But she also really pushed me in sports and especially on the track. So Maura and I grew up playing all kinds of sports, but we were just drawn to cross country and track. And I would run a race and then Mara would come up behind me and run it faster. And so we just kind of pushed each other in that competitive way. Um, But at the end of the day, we were each other's number one fans. So I always rooted for Mara and and she always rooted for me and there'd be all the smack talk in between. But at the end of the day, you know, she was my best friend and I miss her terribly. Yeah, I... (sighs) 
I mean, I kind of, Amber and I have siblings, but they're much different ages than us. So we kind of grew up as only children in a weird way, but we have a lot of friends that have siblings. So it's always curious to me to see they're either really close or they're not at all. Um, And so it's good that you had that friendly competition. Did you ever, I mean, did you ever genuinely get mad at each other or was it ever like really frustrating having her like beating you with these races and stuff? Or did you just use that as motivation to like kick her butt the next time? Oh yeah. I mean, we, we were very angry at each other a lot of times. Um, I remember when we were playing basketball, we had, we lived on a dead end street in a cul-de-sac and at the end of the street there was a basketball hoop and I remember playing one-on-one and just having fierce battles to where it ended like her throwing the ball at me and running back to the house and then me chasing you know just just typical kid stuff and and then, you know, when you're mad at each other and you like do like the sort of silent treatment thing and they're like, do you want ice cream? Yeah, <laughs> it was just it was just typical that that's what we what we did. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. As Julie mentioned, Mora was a runner. Mora was such a good runner that she consistently finished in the top tier of runners in the state of Massachusetts and broke several longstanding school records. In her sophomore year of high school, she was selected as a Boston Globe All-Scholastic in cross-country and qualified for the U.S. National Scholastic Outdoor Championships, where she finished 33rd in the country. While she was busy breaking records and going to cross-country championships, she was also top of her class and won the silver medal in the National Latin exam. The girl was a badass. Julie told us that one of their favorite things to do together was long-distance running. Mora was the perfect running partner. Those long runs can get lonely and probably boring, and having a good running partner is crucial. The sisters would talk for hours while running endless miles. The chats varying from random topics to deep conversations about life and everything in between. Julie told us she's had other running partners over the years at West Point and while in the military, but none of them were as great as Mora. There had been comments made about the Murray kids living in a strict household with parents who pushed too hard and expected too much. When asked about this, Julie made it clear that this couldn't be further from the truth. Oh, my dad was the most supportive dad that you could ask for. And what people don't understand is that long distance runners, like the way that Maura and I were, um, you can't force somebody to do that. You either inherently have the desire to want to run an insane amount of miles and you get pleasure out of that, or you don't. It's not like you can force someone to get up on a Sunday morning and run six miles for the fun of it. Um, So he would actually try to pull us back a little bit. I remember after several races where I didn't do as well as I thought I would come back home and I'd do this three mile course. It was a, just a circular loop around the house just to kind of get away and kind of clear my mind. And he would always discourage that because it wasn't the best thing to do. I mean, I just ran a race. Of course I didn't do as well as I wanted to, but so, you know, in my mind, I thought that would be a good thing to do. Um, but he always discouraged that. And, you know, my dad was, he sacrificed so much for us, um, getting out of work and making sure to be at every single one of our races and being so supportive. And, you know, it just boggles my mind that people said that say that he forced us to run. It's like, you don't force runners to run we're gonna run (laughs) no matter what you know and my dad was a marathoner he ran I think nine marathons in his lifetime and so we grew up watching him and he was our inspiration and that's I think kind of where Mar and I got our um, passion for running was from him so yeah I mean he was he was the best dad you could ask for 
That's great. I could imagine being frustrated with yourself in that moment and be like, well, I'm just going to make myself run more almost as a punishment and having your parent be like, give yourself a break. And you need that. Yeah. I mean, I, I've heard of stories where people go and they're competitive in sports and their parents just aren't able to ever be there. But my dad was always there. And that means so much. And thinking back now as an adult and thinking, you know, if I had to be at all these races and all these kids, I don't know if I'd be able to do it and also take care of my own um, workout regimen, which, which he did. So he, you know, would either get up early or go at lunchtime, but my dad was, you know, getting his miles in as well. Yeah. Um, and also our mother, you know, a lot of people don't, um, talk about our mother, my, our mother passed, um, in 2009 on Mars birthday, but, you know, she was fun and outgoing and always wanted to just, you know, laugh and have a good time. And she would always make fun of me for being so serious all the time. <laughs> and she, she would say, you know, why are you going to bed so early, Julie? <laughs> this is my mother saying this to me. <laughs> <And I'm laughs> so we had a good balance of, um, of parents where my mom recognized the fact that I was super serious and needed to kind of, you know, have a belly laugh every now and then. And she, she helped, she helped me with that. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so, did it, did it work? Did it help or did it frustrate you? Well, you know, I'm so stubborn that I was like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> I need eight and a half hours of sleep. And this is me in high school saying this and, you know, Mara, <laughs> Mara kind of took a little bit more after my mother, um, where she, you know, she got it. She knew that it was important to have balance and, you know, and that, and that carried through, through, um, college and into West Point, why I loved it and Mara didn't, you know, I was different in, yeah. in my structure and, you know, it was evident even in high school when I'm telling my mother that I cannot stay up past nine o'clock. Like it's bizarre that a, a high schooler would say that to their mother, but yeah, it's true. When families dedicate their lives to advocating for their loved ones, they spend most of their time discussing the details of the case, the timelines, the evidence, and picking apart every little aspect during interviews or their own investigation. It can be hard to find the time to reflect and remember the life you shared with someone. This is why we like to ask families what their favorite mundane, everyday memories are. Julie shared that this question was an emotional one for her, but she loved that it gave her a chance to reflect on experiences she shared with Mora and think about the times in her life when she wished her sister could be there. You know, I really miss, obviously, holidays with, with Mara because... You know, our, our parents were divorced um, when Mara was six and I was eight. I could be off with the, with the timeline. But um, it was always great because Mara, even though it, it was kind of sad that we were separated, we had to split our time, Mara would always come up with some jokes and it would make everybody laugh. And we could just laugh together about, you know, my mom's cooking or my grandmother's wrapping paper job or, you know, just little tiny little things like that, that I just miss. And, you know, as I've carried on with my life without Mara, you know, in watching my parents get old and making, you know, ridiculous statements and my da dad telling the same story to us, to me for the, 300th time, I know that I could always lean on Mara to make fun of him. And I just miss that I don't have her to back me up when I, <laughs> when I make fun of him because the smack talk goes between siblings and parent daughter in relationships. So it's just, that's what we do. Um, and that's our way to show others that we love them. Um, so I miss that. I miss, um, being able to have a sounding board for, um, you know, 
vulnerable things that I want to share with somebody, somebody, somebody that I can trust. Because throughout this process, trust has become a casualty, you know, and it's hard to trust people as you know, as freely as I did before, I have all this tragedy and morbid stuff happen to me. Um, so I miss having her as a sounding board and um, someone to gossip with, you know, and, and things like that. I love that. I. It must be so lonely being in the position you are in when you do have so many people that just want to talk about you and your family or say things that are untrue or use you for their own advantage in a lot of ways. And that it must be, yeah, it must be really hard not to have anyone around really that you can really confide in or talk to. Yeah. I, you know, Mars case is so big that people treat it and treat her and treat my family as if we're public property and as if we owe people something and answers. And, you know, I'm pretty open and vulnerable and share a lot, but there are some things that I don't share. And there are a few precious memories and precious pictures and things that I haven't made public. And I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't have to defend myself for why I'm not, you know, sharing everything. I think I've shared enough. And uh, you're right, you know, people have taken advantage of, of that in our vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. It makes me, it makes me sad to know that that, that question upset you the way that it did. But I, to your point, I do think it's, it's important because as a family member who spends most of their time advocating for their for their loved one, you get so caught in the day to day of just trying to sift through new leads and all of the information and answer emails and have these conversations and everything else that I'm sure that that time that you spend together gets away from you after a while. And so I think it's good to bring it back and really focus on who who Mora was and who she was to you and those little things that, you know, really made her Mora. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, of course. And I don't think upset is the right word. I wasn't upset. I was just reflecting. And I um, don't allow myself the time and space to do that as often as I like. So I actually appreciate that you asked me that. So thank you. I never like making anybody cry, though. So whether it's like yeah. good or bad, I'm still like, oh, I didn't want to make you, you know. Sorry about but that. Cry, crying's not always a bad thing. <laughs> no, but I kept my composure for this. So I got my cry out of the way, although I told everyone that I did it. But that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. We don't have to keep that part in if you don't, if you want to. Oh, no, I think it's I, I love that part. I okay. think that's there's value in that. After high school, Julie attended the United States Military Academy at West Point in New York. West Point is one of the most highly acclaimed service academies in the country. Julie thrived there and absolutely loved the discipline, structure, and physicality that the school demanded. Being two and a half years older than Mora, Julie would send letters back home, telling Mora all about how wonderful it was and how much she would love it too. However, Mora and Julie may have been similar in a lot of ways, but they were also very different. The aspects of West Point that Julie appreciated did not vibe with Mora how she hoped it would. When I was at the academy, I would write back to Mora, who was a high schooler, and tell her how much that she would love it. And, you know, when she went through the college application process, she had recruiting letters from Harvard, from Yale, from Brown. Um, she had her pick of any service academy. Uh, and she applied to one, one school, one school only, and that was West Point. And that was because I had built it up and it sort of convinced her that she would love it. And so she joins me at West Point and she doesn't love it. And, uh, you know, she 
wasn't alone in that regard because there's a lot of high overachieving type kids, type A personalities that are very successful in academics and athletics and leadership and their community, but just aren't cut out for the military. And I think that's kind of where Maura fell um, in that spectrum. And she was more of a nurturing type person and wanted to give back in a different way. And so she eventually followed in our mother's footsteps and pursued nursing, which was um, what she was suited for. Besides not loving the structure and rigor that came with attending a school like West Point, Mora also found herself in a little bit of trouble after she stole about five bucks worth of makeup from Fort Knox. Many people have speculated on why Mora made this choice, but the truth is, we don't know. When Julie asked Mora for an explanation, she really didn't have one. What we do know is that part of the cadet honor code is to not lie, cheat, or steal. So Mora's choice landed her in some hot water with the honor board. The honor board is a group of cadets who listen to the facts and evidence and determine a punishment. It's basically a trial by a group of your peers and is a West Point tradition. Julie shared that she had several friends who did much worse than steal makeup and faced the honor board who did not get kicked out of the school. In another interview, she mentioned the punishment usually involved marching for hours in an uncomfortable uniform or things of that nature. At the end of the day, These are still young kids who are going to make mistakes, and they aren't going to be expelled for such behavior. Mora did go through the honor board process, but before her punishment had been adjudicated, she decided to leave West Point. She left. She was not kicked out. There were several factors that led her to make this decision. As we said, Mora didn't love the intense discipline and structure that came with attending West Point. It takes a certain kind of person, like Julie, to thrive in that environment. Mora was also at a crossroads. She was reaching the two-year mark at West Point, which is when cadets have to take the oath of affirmation to serve five years of active duty and then three more years of on-call duty in the ready reserves. Not to mention, 9-11 had just happened. We're going to war and she was being asked to pledge eight more years of her life to the military when she was already unhappy being at West Point. So she chose to leave before she was given her punishment. Honestly, why go through the punishment if you know you don't want to be there anyway? Exactly. We were curious to know what would have happened if Mora had taken the oath of affirmation and then decided to leave. Julie explained there are two options. A person can either pay back the amount of the first two and a half years of schooling, or you can join the army at the lowest rank and work through what they would have owed. Neither one of these options is great, so it's good that cadets are given two years to decide if they want to commit. As we discussed, Mora realized this was not the path for her and enrolled in the nursing program at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Once at UMass, Mora seemed much happier but did have some personal struggles. Julie spoke about Maura's mindset and what she was going through during this time. She seems so much happier. You know, she could sleep in every now and then, um, which is something forbidden at West Point. I mean, you have to be up, bed made, sink clean, all your books lined up perfectly, shoes shined, uniform pristine by 5.30 a.m., So it's not the typical college experience. And then, you know, then you have to march to breakfast because all cadets march to breakfast and you eat your breakfast. And then you cannot skip class. You cannot sleep in. There's, it's just, it's a whole nother world. And, you know, I say this all the time. It's just not everyone is cut out for that. And um, so I would talk to Mara mostly through AOL Instant Messenger, which is uh, kind of dates me, but it, back in the day. <laughs> we are of the same, same era. So, yeah. Okay, okay, you get it, you get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and she, you know, she seemed to be doing well, and she was closer to home, and um, she seemed happy. Do you feel like she was open about what she was going through, or do you think there were some things that she was keeping to herself? Yeah, she tried to keep stuff to herself, um, but with me... I wasn't the one because we were so close. So whenever I noticed something, I would call her on it and she would begrudgingly tell me uh, what was happening. And, you know, there's probably things she didn't tell me, but there's a lot of things, you know, as an older sister, you, you notice. And so I would ask her about certain things, um, you know, and give her advice and, (laughs) and things like that. So she did have um, some struggles with disordered eating, which obviously she wasn't going to share with me, but I found out and, you know, we had long conversations about that and she was embarrassed and ashamed about it as, you know, anyone who's been through it knows it's not an easy thing to to go through Um, but it is something that's very uh, prevalent at schools like West Point and other service academies especially in with athletes female athletes so you know we discussed that a lot and she tried to deny it you know at first which you're not going to be able to get away with that with me and that goes back to the bonds that we built growing up you know I'm her older sister she can tell other people you know whatever but she knew she wasn't getting away with that with me um and that probably irritated her a little bit but at the end of the day I know that she appreciated it and she knew that I loved her and cared about her and just wanted the best for her did she take your advice to heart or was she one to just be like yeah yeah okay I hear you yeah, Mara looked up to me. She she definitely looked up to me, and that's part of why she followed me to West Point and and things like that. And um, I yeah, she she definitely took what I said to heart, and she did seek help and and try to get better. While Mora may have had a better life balance at UMass, her struggles with disordered eating led her to make more questionable decisions. She was caught using someone else's credit card to buy a large amount of food in the middle of the night. Mora was put on three months probation for good behavior. We asked Julia for more details about this, and she's pretty sure that was through Amherst Police Department, but she's not 100% certain. Julie didn't know about Maura using someone else's credit card until after she went missing, and she was still on probation at the time of her disappearance. When talking about Maura's choice to do this, and if it was possible that she didn't want her parents to notice the spending or question her about it, Julie mentioned that the kids never asked for money or racked up their parents' credit cards because they already spent so much on them for their various sports and other activities. They were very aware of what their parents provided for them and didn't want to burden them financially. Even as kids, we wouldn't even ask for anything special. You know, I remember when the champion sweatshirts came out and everyone had the champion sweatshirts. And of course, Mar and I wanted the champion sweatshirts, but we're like, that's way too expensive. We don't want to burden our family with with that. So we we would never ask our parents for money because You know, my dad and and my mom was spending so much on all of our sports and, you know, we were on traveling basketball teams. So that came with travel costs and hotels and uniforms and entry fees. So we would never want to burden them financially. And that's part of the reason why when Mara got in an accident with my dad's car, she was so upset. You know, that was her being just so upset at herself because she felt like she was uh, financially putting a burden on my dad when at the end of the day, it ended up being nothing because insurance would cover it. Um, But yeah, I mean, if you think about the credit card stuff at UMass and you look at it through the lens of somebody that's young and struggling, just looking at the time frame of when the purchases happened kind of puts you into Mara's state of mind. You know, 
who's ordering food at 3 a.m., somebody that is ashamed and embarrassed about what they're doing and doesn't feel good about it. And, you know, you, you notice that and you can see that when you look at other people with disordered eating where there's this trend to do it um, late at night. And that goes into the shame and the embarrassment aspect. Um, of course she knew, and you know, I'm not condoning that she used somebody else's credit card. That was wrong. She knew that was wrong. That was not okay. Um, but it's just another data point and where she was mentally at that time. If she had asked anybody in our family, Hey, can you give me 20 bucks so I can get food? Absolutely. Any of us would, would double that. Um, but she would never want to ask us. So she just didn't, she tried to figure it out on her own, which is really sad. You know, when you think back to it, she needed help. She, she needed help. On the night of Thursday, February 5th, 2004, Maura was doing her work study at one of the UMass dorms where she checked student IDs. This was a great way for her to earn a little money but still have time to study since it was later at night and there wasn't much foot traffic. Maura was in a very competitive nursing program and on the dean's list, so having ample study time was a must. Around 10 p.m., her oldest sister, Kathleen, called her. Kathleen struggled with addiction and had just gotten out of rehab that day. She called Mora to vent about the disappointment she was feeling in herself because her then fiance picked her up from the rehab facility and took her straight to a liquor store. Needless to say, the Murray family were not fans of this guy and expressed to Kathleen on multiple occasions that she could do so much better. But the truth can be hard to see when you're in the middle of it, as a lot of us know. During their conversation, Maura didn't have much of a reaction other than reassurance and showing support for Kathleen. She didn't seem overly upset or angry during the phone call. A little while later, Maura's long-distance boyfriend, Bill, who was stationed at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, called her. According to Bill, it was a standard conversation and nothing really stood out or seemed out of the ordinary. More time goes by and Maura suddenly becomes so upset that she can't function. Her supervisor escorts her back to her room, and when asked what's wrong, the only thing Maura says is, my sister, my sister. This event was the first big red flag that something more was going on. Here's Julie talking about Maura's emotional state that night and the events that took place over the next couple of days. We still really don't know what it was that upset Mara to that extent. Was it a call from Kathleen several hours earlier? I don't know. You know, um, I know that Mara would have tried to hold space for Kathleen in that time where Kathleen was sharing, hey, you know, this horrible thing happened. I've already relapsed and I'm dating this piece of crap guy. Um, I don't believe that Mara would have broken down kind of during that conversation because I know that Mara was empathetic enough to know that she needed to be strong for Kathleen because obviously she's sharing something like that. So I don't know. I don't really know exactly what caused her to be that upset. Um, so that was the first major red flag and that was Thursday and she disappeared on Monday. So Thursday goes into Friday. Friday, there's a big snowstorm at UMass. Classes are canceled. Not a whole lot happening on Friday. I know that um, Mar didn't mention it to me through, um, you know, phone call or chat or whatever. I was back from South Korea at the time. I was in um, North Carolina. So then Saturday comes and my dad realizes Mara needs a new car because her car was smoking um, and running on three cylinders. And he told her, do not drive this car. I'm coming up and we're going to get a new car. And when I say new, I mean used, but for a college kid, (laughs) that means new. So Mara had been calling around um, to different numbers on classified ads in the newspaper 
and it's on her phone records and it shows that she was actively trying to find a car from um, her winter break up until that time. And obviously she didn't find anything. So my dad came up to UMass, they go car shopping. Mara calls me at 3.21 PM, I think it is, 3.37, something like that. And tells me about the cars that they looked at. And I'm like, this is great, whatever. You know, I don't really remember the specifics of the phone call, uh, but that would be the last time I would ever talk to my sister. Um, so then they don't end up buying a car. They narrow it down to like three. And they thought at that time they had the whole next day to continue to car shop or if they didn't find anything the next weekend, whatever. So Mara's friend Kate was coming home from a track meet and said, hey, do you want to hang out? Mara said, yeah, we're at this um, brewery. Do you want to come and get dinner and drinks with my dad? My dad's in town, which was something that was typical because whenever my dad was around, um, we would invite everyone we knew to go out because he would always pay for dinner. (laughs) (laughs) And as college kids, that was perfect. So they do that. And then I think it was Kate or maybe it was Mara gets a call from another friend named Sarah. And Sarah said, hey, we're having a little get together at the dorm later. You guys do want to come. And so Kate and Mara like, yeah, absolutely. So they dropped my dad off at the motel that he was staying at. And they but before that, they went to a liquor store and um, Mara got this box wine, which will be important later. So that she gets this box wine. Um, and they drop my dad off at the motel. And then for some reason they decide to take my dad's new car, his Corolla that he had just purchased to the dorm. I think it's because she wanted to have access to the car in the morning so that she didn't have to ask him to come pick her up or, I don't know. I don't really know the rationale, but they take the car. Yeah. Take the car, go to the dorm party. Dorm party is kind of shrouded in mystery because nobody knows exactly what happened or who was there. And the the friend that hosted it, Sarah, hasn't been very forthcoming with providing information about what happened. Um, So around 2.30 a.m., Kate decides to leave, and so does Mara around the same time. And instead of going up to her dorm room, Mara decides to take the Corolla back to my dad's motel. But when she does that, she crashes about a mile off campus head on um, at a T intersection into a guardrail and causes thousands of dollars worth of damage to my dad's new car. So this is Saturday night. So a tow truck comes, the police come. What's interesting is they don't cite her for DUI. They don't do any medical evaluation on her whatsoever. And she just basically gets into the tow operator's vehicle and drives back to the motel. And the car was taken to this um, repair shop that was right beside the motel. So obviously Mara was so upset with herself because she caused all this damage and um, burden on my dad. And she, uh, you know, was crying and was upset. And my dad finally figures out that insurance would cover it. There was some loophole where insurance would cover it. And he was like, Mara, don't worry about it. Insurance will cover it. What I need you to do is get these accident forms tomorrow, which would be Monday, so that we can make sure everything's straight. And she agrees to do that. And so now we're in Sunday. My dad drops Mara off at the dorm. That would be the last time he ever saw her. And she was crying when he last saw her, which is heartbreaking. Um, that image is heartbreaking to think about. Um, she does call him on Sunday night calls my dad and they talk about again, Hey, you need to get these accident forms. So then Monday comes along and that's the day where she disappeared. 
Fred never figured out why Mora drove back to his motel instead of going upstairs to her dorm room after leaving the party on Saturday night. One interesting tidbit of information that Julie shared with us is that Mora's accident didn't occur until about an hour after she and her friend Kate left the party between 2 and 2.30 a.m. Kate has been very open with the Murrays about the events that took place that night, but she doesn't know why Mora didn't go upstairs to her room or if something happened after she last saw her. The girl who threw the party has been less cooperative about sharing details of what went on that night. What we do know is that it doesn't take an hour to drive from the dorm to the motel. Mora was known to drive insanely fast, but speed wasn't listed as a factor on the accident report. The report said she was inattentive and slid on debris on the road. That was it. No speed or intoxication was involved. Mora had left her phone in her dorm room and didn't have a key to Fred's motel room. So after the tow truck driver dropped her off, she had to call or buzz someone to come let her into Fred's room or call his room so he could come get her. This is one of those motels where the office manager either lives on site or nearby, so she had to wait a while before getting a response. She eventually gets to Fred's motel room, where she borrows his phone to call her boyfriend, Bill. Bill said she was crying and upset about the accident, and probably trying to figure out how to tell Fred that she had wrecked his car. Mid-morning, she tells her dad what happened. There are a lot of people who have made assumptions about how Fred handled the news, and honestly, I think most people would expect yelling in this type of situation. But that wasn't Fred's style. People say my dad screamed at her, which is so funny to me because I've never heard my dad scream at us ever. That is not the way that he um, responded to anything that we did. Uh, You know, and a lot of times we wished he would have screamed at us because it would have made us feel better. But he just kind of matter of fact, like, here's what we need to do. You know, you screwed up, blah, 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 blah. So the people that say my dad screamed at Mara are making it up. Fred and Mora talked one more time on Sunday night about the accident form she needed to pick up the next day. She was a night owl, so it wasn't unusual for her to do homework late into the night and early morning. Mora had a nursing school assignment to look up pregnancy terms, and she and a group of other students split up the terms so they didn't each have to do all of it. She submitted her assignment at 3.32 a.m. on Monday, February 9th, the day she disappeared. To Julie, This is a data point that Mora wasn't planning to disappear because if that were the case, why would she take the time to complete her homework? This is a fair point. If you weren't planning to return to school, you wouldn't be worried about a bad grade. After this, Mora starts making some interesting searches on her computer. Here's Julie explaining what Mora searched for and the rest of her actions that day. Then she does a number of internet searches for um, the Berkshires and Burlington, Vermont, kind of in the general area. Now, I posed the question to law enforcement, did she look up the Berkshires in Massachusetts or the Berkshires in Vermont? Because there's multiple Berkshires and they're different locations. So when people say the Berkshires as a Massachusetts resident or someone that grew up in Massachusetts, I'm thinking Western Mass, but it could also mean some place completely different. But uh, law enforcement couldn't pinpoint that for me. So anyway, she's looking up directions somewhere else. And then She gets some sleep, and then there's no activity until mid-morning on Monday, February 9th. And that's when she picks up some more internet searches, and now she's looking at um, condos and things like that. So she eventually calls a condo owner at a place in Bartlett, New Hampshire, which is a complex that my family had stayed at before but we didn't rent out that particular unit. Um, She doesn't secure a reservation. Then she emails her professors, and this might be a little bit out of order, but these are the main bullet points of what she did that day. Um, 
she emails her professor saying that there's a death in the family and that she needed some time away from school. And in my mind, that's just a typical college aides excuse to where somebody's not going to ask additional questions. It's kind of like a free pass. Like no one's going to say, tell me more about that. <laughs> They're just going to be super supportive. There was no death in the family. Um, and then she calls a information line called 1-800-GO-STO. And Stowe is a ski resort in the Burlington, Vermont area. She doesn't end up booking a reservation. It was just a information line that discussed ski conditions, weather conditions, things like that. So she never spoke to a human. So again, doesn't book a reservation. But here you have Mara calling Bartlett, New Hampshire and Burlington, Vermont, which are very different geographic areas. And it takes about two hours to drive from Bartlett to Burlington. So what this indicates to me is she didn't really have a clear plan on what the hell her plan was, other than I want to go north. Mora then plays phone tag with Bill, but they don't connect. She sends him an email saying she loves him, but doesn't really feel like talking at the moment, and she'll call him later. But they never talk. She then goes to an ATM and withdraws $280 from her account, leaving just under $20 in the bank. People who follow Mora's case get stuck on this amount. But honestly, it makes perfect sense. Overdraft fees come into consideration here. And to me, this is another data point that Mora wasn't planning to disappear. If she had no intention of returning, would she really be worried about overdrafting her account? Probably not. After getting the cash, she heads to a liquor store and buys $40 worth of alcohol, which included a bottle of Kahlua and vodka. This may seem like a lot of alcohol for one person, but Nora's favorite drink was a Black Russian, which is a mix of Kahlua and vodka, and those ingredients have to be purchased in large quantities. This is coming from someone whose drink of choice in college was a white Russian, so it doesn't seem strange to me at all that she would purchase large bottles to use over a long period of time. Not only does Mora make a purchase at the liquor store, she also returns 79 cans to recycle in exchange for $3.95. We know this because of the receipt found in her abandoned car. This is yet another data point to show that she was not trying to disappear. In Julie's words, if Mora's plan was to say, screw it all and disappear, why would she take the time to recycle? It just doesn't make sense. Once she leaves the liquor store, she gets the accident form she promised to give her Fred, which were also found in her car. The plan was to speak with Fred on Monday night so he could help her fill out the forms. Here is another example showing that Mora was running important errands and making future plans which doesn't make sense if she had no intention of being around for those events. At 4.37 p.m., Mora uses her cell phone to check her voicemail. This would be her last known cell activity ever. Almost three hours later, Mora is seen in Haverhill, New Hampshire. There's several hours where there's no nothing, no activity at all. And then at 7.27 p.m., a woman named Faith Westman looks out her window and hears this loud thud and notices a black Saturn on the side of the road in the opposite lane facing the wrong direction. So she's in the eastbound lane facing westbound, if that makes sense. And she calls 911. And that was the last time that we've ever heard from Mara. After Faith Westman called 911, a bus driver and resident of the area, Butch Atwood, sees Mora on the side of the road and stops to ask if she needs help. This is somewhere between 727 and 733 p.m. When Butch asks Mora if she'd like him to call for help, she tells him that she has already called AAA and has got it under control. Butch doesn't believe this, though, because there's no cell phone service in the area. And there still isn't to this day. So when he returns to his home about 100 meters from Mora's car, 
he calls 911 on his home phone at 7.42 p.m. We asked Julie her thoughts on whether or not Mora really had tried to call for help when Butch came by. Mora's cell records don't show any activity during this time period, so we know she didn't talk to anyone on the phone. Perhaps she was planning to call and said, I've already called AAA, thinking in her mind, I'm about to call AAA once you get out of my face and leave me alone. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And then at that moment, she realizes, oh no, I don't have any communication. I'm in a bad situation. I should have accepted that help. I'll accept help from the next person that isn't this big bus driver guy that may have creeped her out. Um, So I'm thinking that maybe she hadn't formulated her plan and was just trying to get him away um, before she knew that there was no cell phone service. So at some point, Mara realizes there's no service here. I'm in a whole lot more of a vulnerable position than I, you know, originally thought when this bus driver is asking me for help. That's just me thinking. And as knowing Mara and knowing how I would have reacted, I would have been all set. I'm good to go. I got AAA. And then thinking, oh, I'm going to call and then realize, oh, I don't have the signal. Um, I'm not saying that's 100% what happened. Obviously, I wasn't there. I don't know. Um, But it is possible. And I could definitely see Mara saying, don't worry about it. I don't want to burden you because that's how she was. Mora's hesitation to accept help from Butch makes complete sense. He was a large man in height and size, and here she is, a woman alone on the side of the road, not knowing if he can be trusted. A lot of us would probably do the same thing in her situation. Butch's story about what happened that night also changed several times. First, he was sitting in the bus. Then he was standing outside of the bus talking to Mora from the other side of the car. However, Julie made a good point about witnesses not being infallible. We don't know why he changed his story or if there was any motive behind it. But humans don't have the best memory. And there's a reason why witness statements don't hold as much weight as, say, physical or DNA evidence. He also agreed to take two polygraph tests and failed the first one. But as we know, polygraph tests aren't admissible in court, and we're talking about an older gentleman who is not in the best health, strapped to a lie detector and questioned about a missing woman. That's bound to make anyone's heart race a little too fast. Julie doesn't know if Butch's house was ever searched. If it was, law enforcement didn't share that with her. But she did share that he lived with his common-law wife, Barbara, and his mother at the time of Morris' disappearance and they were both home at the time. The chance of Butch having something to do with Morris' disappearance is honestly very low. But what we do know is that he was the last person to see her. Getting back to the events of that night, we have two calls to 911, Faith Westman's at 7.27 p.m. and Butch Atwood's at 7.42 p.m. According to official records, Cecil Smith, an officer with the Haverhill Police Department, arrives on the scene at 7.46 p.m. and finds the black Saturn allegedly locked, but Mora is nowhere to be found. In next week's episode, we will continue our conversation with Julie and break down the poor investigation, missteps, and misinformation surrounding Mora's disappearance. We will also talk about what it's like to live with a missing family member, Julie's Engage with Empathy campaign, and the 20-year vigil for Mora. Until next time, stay safe. And make good choices. Bye. Bye.